Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your patience and a big thank you to June for Junie June. Thank you for being the miracle you are. Um, before um, before I introduce our guest speaker, Gladys Calaccini, I do want to take a moment to invite you all to join with me in grounding yourself that long before we made art um, on this country, the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people for generations, thousands of generations, practiced song and dance here. They shared stories, they made sculptures, they made paintings, they practiced healing. And actually those rituals continue today. And please join me with joy um, and honor in acknowledging their elders past, present and emerging. So um, what a treat to introduce Gladys Calaccini. Um, Gladys is a scholar and a visual artist from Lusaka, Zambia. Her work centers on notions of erasure, memory and representations and visibilities of women in colonial resistance histories. Focusing on the duality of memory and history, Gladys's work considers ideas about mourning, remembering and forgetting in relation to commemoration of women, Gladys is currently artist in residence in the Department of Drawing and Printmaking here at the VCA. And of course, her exhibition, This Memory Will Not Fade, is currently on show at the Fiona and Sydney Maya Gallery. Also, many of you were at the exquisitely moving uh, performance last night, uh, also in the Fiona and Sydney Maya Gallery. These practices are done in sharing her stories. Wherever you are in Federation Hall or in Zoom land, Please make Gladys very, very welcome. Um, hello. Um, my presentation for today is called Invisible Freedom Fighters, Restoring and Healing the Independence Archive or the Archive of Independence. It's um the presentation is centered to in some ways give some insight into my practice or what I'm really interested in. And I'm going to start with a quote that reads, images shape our lives in various ways. Mental images are part of ourselves, while material images are a basis of ourselves and our relationship to the past and present. Images also influence our perception of the world and also our place in it. Picture the exact same woman. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know what I've done. Picture the exact same woman. Rather than her husband, this one and this one are going to work. She has her own family area as she goes off. The battle she fights with her, 
The opposing soldiers that back to the back half are to run into the city with the city. Her first look at the tower as she gets captured by her opponent. Her corpse is found alone with the city of her fallen soldiers and her fellow combatants ready to come up and down. Because her family can not see her corpse, years later, the most praised of the Irish. Does not have a tombstone that makes a new opportunity. It only bears the symbol of the person that is a place where is a sacred space where fallen heroes are laid to rest. Could you kindly sit with this image for about 10 seconds before we proceed? I think images are powerful. They are not merely just representations or objects that are foundational principles of the way in which we see. They are things that help us construct our identities. I would really like to thank you for participating in this exercise of constructing these images. I recognize that both images are of a violent nature and can be uncomfortable to confront. But as a final aspect of this exercise, I would, like you to, I would like to request you to place the two images that you constructed side by side and consider the following questions. Who among us the two women in the two images are, is likely to be perceived as a freedom fighter and to be celebrated for contributing to the liberation of her country? The second question is, in what ways would you imagine either of the women's stories being commemorated by future generations? That is if they can remember who they are. See, these questions are very instrumental to my practice. My practice considers questions like who deserves to be honored and how do we construct perceptions of what we identify as liberation heroes and um, because a lot of my work deals with engaging with archives, I ask questions around what, how we form the importance of historical figures and who we choose to archive. You see, um, when I started going into the archives, I started going into the archives looking for stories of women freedom fighters. And I must admit that when I went in the first time, I went in with a rather naive and biased perception of what a freedom fighter was. I was expecting to see images of women with guns, images of women with babies on their back and so forth. But then going back and trying to find other ways in which I could construct images of women beyond my perception of sight. So creating images through sound, through voice, through touch and feeling. I started looking at some of the things that I could hear say, I could hear, or that I could, that could help me form kind, some kinds of images of women. Um, and I went in there, of course, with a lot of guidance from like a theoretical perspective. And one of the, one of the most influential texts that had helped was by Sadia Hartman, which opens with the sentence in the early 20th century, young black women were in open were in open struggle or open liberation. And also I used another quote that I found from some documents in the archives that was by the first um, first lady, the first first lady of the Republic of Zambia known as Betty Kaunda. And she's speaking at a conference where she says, women must take their impact women must make their impact felt in all fields in order to strengthen the foundations of our revolutions. Women have a big responsibility in combating exploitations. Women are also part and parcel, a part and, a part and parcel of the lines of defense against those, who, those whose interest is to keep Africa in a perpetual state of bondage. 
Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, I went in there looking for a woman called Julia Chica Moneta, who I've circled over there. Sorry, I'll move this a little bit because I realize now that it's in my way. Okay, yeah, I went in there looking for a story of a woman called Julia Chikamonica. Julia Chikamonica was a member of the UNI party and is popularly known for her participation in a naked protest over here, where they take off their clothes in protesting a British inspired constitution for Zambia. Um, when I began tracing images of her, I couldn't find any images rather than except for this one and this one in the National Archives of Zambia. Uh, upon searching from different kinds of places, I was able to find negat original negatives of her photographs over here in the ZANIS archives, which are the Zambia National Service Information Archives, the Broadcasting Archives. And also looking through a, a couple of images, I was also able to find this image of her in the Livingstone Museum, which is about seven hours drive from Lusaka. Uh, this image is a reproduction I've done of the original. This is not the original image over here, but this is the image in the archives. It is cropped and has a citation, which um, I imagine archivists or people working in the archives have come up with to sort of speak to roles of women in liberation struggles. This image I digitalized from the original negative I found, and it is not um, cropped per se. Uh, it's taken by a photographer called Tishna, who I imagine was a journalist because there's not very much information about him in either archives. But he was taking the photograph basically for documentation purposes because they were documenting this protest that happened in 1916. And more images. Um, as I was searching more for her, I was then able to now start finding some of the words that I could attach to her or things that she had said to help me build an image of who she was. And I found this image, this quote, which I particularly like, which says, we walked down Cairo Road we just wanted the white man, particularly Roy Walensky, to know that African people were the only people who could build their nation, not them to build the nation for us. And this is a quote she says after this protest against the British inspired constitution. Yeah, and then of course, because I've been in the archives, I've been scanning a lot of images and digitalizing them and so forth. And also I've been, over the time, been tracing some liberation heroes whom I could find and having interviews and filming and filming them while they speak about the era of independence and also while they identify some of their colleagues who helped them in the struggle, particularly women. A lot of times the women are unnamed, like the images you see right now on your screen. But the stories that are told by the women liberation heroes who are still alive today they are named, at least some of them. Uh, so speaking more towards my work, um, my work really starts from a place of my feelings or how I felt when I was in the archives. I felt absence to me related really very closely to this idea of death, like something that had passed out of sight, you know, because I couldn't see it. And my initial reaction was to mourn so in a way that I would mourn somebody who has passed, I thought about ways in which I could mourn invisibility. And then this is when you come to my work. Um, the work is not in any particular kind of order in terms of like years or years or timeline, but more in terms of conceptual. Concept is what I'm going to relate to it in. So in this particular work, it's called uh, This Memory Will Not Fade. It's this memory. A lot of my projects are huge and also somehow interconnected, which is also the name of the exhibition at the Fiona and Sidney Meyer Gallery right now. Um, this is part of a, uh, a project. This project looks more really to the idea of mourning. 
or morning access. Um, and it looks at certain rituals or practices that are done during morning, like laying flowers for, for, for the dead and tending to graves. And you, you can see some of it. It consists of this particular series consists of photographic images only. Well, there's some video, you'll never know with someone like me, but then maybe there's some video somewhere that will pop up in the future. But right now, it's still images. My screen has gone blank. I'm not sure what's happening. Oh, I can skip this video. I don't need this video. I don't need this video. So it's one of the videos that's playing as part of the part of the exhibition at the Fiona and Sydney Maya Gallery. It's a silent video. Okay, maybe I speak about it a little bit since it's a little bit about mourning. Um, it's a silent video in which I'm I'm trying to blur lines between collective and individual mourning. The installation of this work is large such, such that viewers can interact and go around it. But the subject of this work is my own personal mourning of my lost of my late brother. In the video, I sit down in the exact clothes I wore to my brother's funeral, and I sit and contemplate about him. The viewers, though, come to this work without this knowledge. So they are confronted with their own kinds of personal losses in a way that they can engage with mine. Of course, in silence, because this particular video has no sound. How do I go to the next slide? Do I wait for the video to finish playing? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me laugh, English. <laughs> yeah. So um, after thinking about ideas of mourning, I went back to the archive. And because the archive presents itself as a very static place, you know, as a place that gives you the idea that history is permanent and it can move in a certain kind of way, I think that memory is the opposite. I think that memory is very, can fluctuate. It fluctuates heavily from time to time. And I was thinking of ways of making the archive do this, move, and not just be static. So this is the next portion of work that I'm going to go into. And to do this, I started by juxtaposing archival photographs that I would find in the archives and against video footages of the documentations and research I was doing, looking for ways in which women um, practice mnemonic practices or in the ways in which they inserted their bodies in public spaces, at least within the context of it. memories. Um, here also, I have more documentation of of
let me update them a little bit. But they're very similar in what's happening and what they're doing. It's important to, to, for me to make note that these videos or these video documentations are also part of the broader project. Um, this memory will not fade. Yeah. As part of this project also, some of the photographic documentations I have done is inviting various women most of them from my family to come and participate in these practices. While others I watch, as I will speak about a little bit later in this presentation, in these particular performances, the women are invited to, and to sit in silent in public spaces and think about women who are important to them or women they feel like commemorating. And these performances range from about 30 minutes to about two hours, depending on the participant or the person that's offering the memory. In the images you see in your screen, this is actually an aunt of mine and she sits for approximately 30 minutes while she thinks about her mother. She thinks about her mother in a way that complicates this notion that we think of a freedom fighter. Her mother is not recognized as a freedom fighter because her mother was not a member of a political party and her mother did not go to war or to protest in any kind of sense, but her mother lived through the liberation struggle. Like everybody else, she was subjected to what they, the, what they were subjected to. And like everybody else, she voted when it was time to vote in a new, a new political party. Over here, again, this is a close relative. This is my grandmother as she participates in the same performance. For those who participated yesterday in the performance, this is the, this is the same woman on the projection, but on a different day. Because with, um, with her, because it's a very close relation, I've had enough time to do several of these um, performances or works with her. And for me, because she's of a certain age and she's the, uh, well, she's not the only closest person to me that has lived through the liberation struggle. Other members, other members of my family have participated in the liberation struggle, but she is one of the most open in telling most of this story. So this is why you will see most of her presence in a lot of my work, yeah. And then I now come to, which is probably going to be the last segment in which I think about memory as a, in its fluidity. Uh, when I was speaking earlier, I started by saying that the archives usually present itself as a very stable place in which memory stays. But I, as I have stated, I think of memory as fluctuating and I think about it in terms that it is fluid. Um, in this particular kinds of works that we're now going to see, I'm seeing how memory is passed on from one person to the next person through different kinds of rituals. And also how it changes every time it is passed on from one person to another. In that the person that's sharing it is either sharing with one less detail or one extra detail in this way or a different kind of perspective. And the entry point into this, into this particular segment of the work is again my, my family, again, close relation. So what you're looking at in the images is my cousin over here, Mutale, and she is getting inducted into the Mother's Union in the Catholic Church. And a lot of these uh, groups, women's groups like the Women's League and so forth, in some ways can be linked back to the Women's League that some people like Julia Chikamoneka was part of that I mentioned earlier. In the independence era, or the era before independence, 
Most women participated as members of political parties through branches that we refer to as women's league. So you'd have something like the UNIPS Women's League or the Northern Rhodesia's Federation of uh, Women or something like this. But then after independence, uh, this idea sort of phased out of the political arena and re-emerged in the Christian circles where you have organizations of women. And so you have them in the Catholic church or in the Anglican churches. And a lot of times they wear this and sometimes they have the practices where they will wash hands as a, as a way of care or as a way of anointing, which is what then informs the next segment of the works. And this is just a little bit of more documentation of these ideas of women's league. So you have the Catholic ones, the UCZ, UCZ is the United Church of Zambia. It's a woman in the Catholic church giving um, um, Holy Communion. This is a member of the Women's League at my aunt's funeral, so Mutale's mother's funeral. This is her funeral also. So they also participate in mourning. Um, here, this is during Corpus Christi. They are, they are performing again in the church. And over here is two images from a personal archive of um, family members that passed away. And um, yeah, so this is coming back to this idea of cleansing and fluidity and considering the capacity or the probability of water to hold memory. In these performances, I wash um, people's hands and ask them to offer stories as a way of collecting memories. When I'm filming it in studio or in other spaces where it allows, uh, I invite people to come and wash either their feet or their hands and sometimes they can wash each other's hands the only condition is that while they while they do it is while they do it that they tell stories of women or that they share stories of women or anybody that identifies as a woman while they do this and then their their stories are collected through water which eventually i offer to a place of significance and this place of significance can be significant in many different ways. So it could be significant in terms of it holds a particular history, or it could be significant in that it is a sacred place of ritual or worship, or even mourning sometimes, except graveyards, because you know I haven't I have a little bit of complicated relationship with graveyards. Yeah. Yeah. Here. Uh, this is my sister again. So a lot of my family members have participated in this, as you can imagine. This is my sister over here, my older sister. This is Auntie Betty and Auntie Betty. They're both my mother's sister. They have the same name. So they washed each other's feet. Yeah, this is my housemate. This is my grandmother. So the rest of the video from the part of the performance yesterday, this is my grandmother and two of my cousins washing her feet as she tells us stories of women during the liberation struggle. Uh, over here is the first iteration of when I washed people's hands in a public space, within a public context. Um, over here is yesterday for those of you who were able to participate and thank you very much for those who participated. And this, this is also other women who participate in a lot of these rituals and who help who are part of the um, Women's League, this one is St. Teresa, from St. Teresa, yes. They, they, help, uh, they helped me a lot in finding information and participated in some of the performances. Also in their thingy, but to give you uh, an idea of what the installations look like when I have more of the videos in one space. So the way to think about the work, and I'm going to an end right Right now, the way to think about the work is that when it is installed, I think about it as an army of female bodies performing or retelling different kinds of stories of women. And I think I'll end here. This is the end. After. Thanks so much, Gladys. And thank you so much for taking us through all of that and um, you know, and just sharing your life so generously because it's not the thing I'm left with that it, it's not just you, it's your family and a whole community. So really thank you for, for bringing that to us today. 
Oh, Does anyone have a question for, for Gladys? Yeah, please. So I'm going to just repeat the questions for the people in Zoom. So the question is, could you speak about your distrust or whatever it is that you've got about graveyards and cemeteries? Ah, well, I, I don't necessarily think it's a distrust or disdain per se, but I, the graveyard for me is a place that has too many dead bodies, you know, and my... I, I, I don't think I have a very positive uh, reaction to, to death. I understand that death sometimes can be a release for some people, especially if maybe the person has been suffering. But I think ever since my brother passed, because he passed when he was really young, he was 20, so I don't really particularly love this idea of sitting still in a place there. So maybe... Yeah, it's maybe it comes from that place, like a personal place of seeing people I can't see on the everyday. Yeah, please, Vicky. I guess I was when you mentioned graveyard, I guess I went straight back to your very young aunt. And mm. I, I wondered if her, you know, if there's uh, you know, some relationship there to how you got regard to graveyards as a place where things are scattered and not able to kind of be animated and moving in the same way that you want to like. Ah, well, well, thank you very much for that question. I do think of the two very similarly. In some of the work, I thought of the archive as a graveyard or as a mortuary or a morgue, a place that stored a lot of dead bodies. Um, but somehow, I don't think of the graveyard as a static place because I believe in ghosts, you know? I believe that there's an otherworldly place that exists. I also don't think that when people die, then they're just dead. I think it's the physical body that's dead. So I think that their spirits wander in different places. And because maybe, maybe it's the context where I'm coming from, because the context where I'm coming from, it's very important that when somebody has died, we have a funeral and then you have a body viewing and then that you go and re literally bury the body. And of course, this is some. This is to allow closure for mourners. Um, but my grandmother also told me that it's to communicate to the dead that they need to move on. On the reason that we have funerals in the homes, or that the body goes to the church and then not necessarily to the home a lot of times before it goes to the graveyard, is to tell the spirit where to go. So in my mind, that's where the most of them are because most of them have been told that this is your home now. So I don't think of it necessarily as static, but maybe more as like the movement is, is invisible because I can't see it with my naked eye. I don't know if this helps. Um, um, yeah, please. Um, do you have any advice, both personal and related, for uh, artists that might be kind of searching um, into the past or into the art um, you know, uh, feeling vulnerable exploring that space where they just might not ever connect to what they're seeing in the well, I'll, t I'll tell you this. For me, the archive is both interesting and frustrating at the same time, you know? And a lot of the frustration is this feeling of not finding anything, uh, usually with the eye and so forth. Um, and I did go to the archive a lot of times to look for things, um, but I did 
um, some readings. And I don't know if you know the book. Um, um, it's by Mesoff. Mesoff uh, is the right to look. It's called The Object Stays Back by James Elkins. Yeah, and he there's this one page where he's talking about that sometimes we don't see things in the archives because we are the ones who are blind. So he's talking about blindness and he's not referring necessarily as blindness as the inability to see with your eyes. He's defining blindness as the inability to construct images. The, he argues that sometimes we go into the archives and then we argue that something is not there, but then the object is staring back at us and we cannot see it because of our own biases or because of the way in which we are looking at it. Uh, and in my case, a lot of the objects, I could not see them uh, because they were really not there in the archives. Some of them were there in the archives, just placed in a place that I wouldn't have looked or a place that I wouldn't have figured they would be. But I found that when I kept quiet and confronted some of my own biases, like maybe how I defined certain terms like freedom fighter or what I wanted to listen to and really quieted down my voice. This really helped me a lot to start listening to the archive because the archive in as much as it does conceal, it does reveal. So I would think about it in that way. Um, but like what helped me in terms of like personally to be able to practice was to learn to keep quiet and build like an actual real relationship with the archive. So sometimes I went to the archive to just sit and chill. Like at some point people at the archive thought I worked there. You know, like I don't work here. I just sort of come here. And then sometimes they ask me, they're like, why, why are you here? And I was like, I'm waiting for something. I don't know what it is, but then I figure when I, when I find it, when I hear it or when I see it, and the lady I was talking to was like, because when I said, when I see, when I hear it, she was like, <laughs> don't be hearing voices now. <laughs> but then maybe this is just it. You do need to hear the voices. Yeah. Right. And, and we'll just finish with this last question from, from all right. We've got, we've got two last questions. <laughs> I have you first and then, and then this question here, please. Um, about it. Um, firstly, I, firstly, for me, it came from the idea of thinking of something that changes, so like something that is like fluid, but also um, in my research, I found that water, water is used in a lot of uh, rituals. When a baby is born, they wash the baby with water. When a, somebody dies, in Zambia at least, they wash the body, and this ritual is very important, the washing of the body. A family member must be there. And once they've washed the body, where that water is disposed is also very important. So the water can't be disposed from anywhere. And some people buy that water for other kinds of rituals. Like it's an actual commodity. And I also thought about water bodies in the landscape or in the thing in the world, as you think about it as a river, they're also sites of a lot of spiritual practices. You know, people think of that underneath there, there's a whole different world. In Zambia, for example, people think that in the Victoria Falls, there's a creature called Nyami Nyami underneath there. And some people think that, no, if you put certain kinds of uh, objects in there, especially after rituals, even if it's like clay pots or remains of it, that you've given it to other, to another world. And in other ceremonies like uh, Kusefia Pangwe Napsef, um, I'm not sure how to translate this directly. Maybe you'll help me. But in, in this ceremony, they put food in the water to feed ancestors. So I'm, I began to just trace the importance of water in its use in rituals and everyday life. And then now I'm really interested in how much it holds in and of itself. Yeah. I'll just finish with your question. Um, 
Um, yeah, that one's loaded. Another loaded question. <laughs> um, like, I think maybe it helps that when I started this project, I wasn't really thinking of, oh, I'm performing this huge task of making women invisible, women visible to people who might not know them. But for me, it was genuinely because I was curious about a woman called Julia Chica Monica, and I really wanted to find a lot of information about her. But then going in there uh, and speaking about archives, speaking back to you, because I was searching for her, she revealed her friends and who revealed her friends, who revealed her friends and so forth until the chain goes on. Um, yeah, so then I just started making that and then Somehow it's important work, but you know, I don't know. I was just curious, you know, because I would be curious about such a thing. And then in terms of making space to make my work, I think because my work is part of my life. You know, I make work as I live. I I make artwork when I'm seated at home with my family. I make work when I go to church with my family. I make work when I'm eating. It's kind of like, of course, at some point I sit down in the studio and have to do like some kind of work making type situation, but a lot of it happens in the spaces in which I actually e exist. And maybe this also speaks back to my constant returning to Zambia. You know, like every year I'm in Zambia for a while. It doesn't matter where I live in the world. I always end up going back there because that's how I make my work, I guess also, because the, the work is important to me. It's very, in as much as it's about like bigger notions of history and memory and so forth, I think a lot of my work is more about my family life and my personal take. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Gladys, and thank you everyone in Zoom and everyone in Federation Hall. Um, we'll see you for Art Forum next Thursday, but please just one more time, join me in thanking Gladys for the journey.